Today's stuff we're going to be learning is Bava Messiah Daf Kafav. Today's stuff is sponsored in memory of Harav Shmar Yahu, Yosef Chaim Ben Yaakov Israel, Harav Chaim Kanievsky Zatzal. Um, we are going to, first of all, just perm some after all those celebrating perm today, Shushan Perm. And we're going to get started. I'll review very briefly the mission we saw on yesterday's Daf. So we started at the very end of the Daf with another set of cases where we have. Okay, the first case was matzabigal. You find money or something, uh, a lost item under a pile of rubble. Okay, the assumption is whoever it was definitely had yeush about it. There's a bit of a question both on this and the next case, which is Bakotel Yashan, who was in an old wall. If you remember, we said, oh, it could be back from the time before the Jews even conquered the land. And then we said it had to be that it, it already was rusty. It looked very old, and that's why. But in these cases, there's actually a big question the commentary to ask, which is, if, let's say, it's a Kotel Yashan that's in my house, or there's rubble and it's in my house, why is it not mine? Right? Wouldn't we assume that the rubble, it's not so clear if it was in public, if it was in someone's house, or someone's property, let's say, maybe not my house, but some property that I own. Didn't we learn the Chatzir Shaladam Koneh, that my, my Chatzir can acquire things? So if it's in my domain, in my wall, it should be mine. Who cares if the Amoraim left it? So the commentaries say that when chatzir works, and this is just a different halacha, but when chatzir, my courtyard, can acquire something, that's when I know of its existence. The idea here is we're talking about things that I don't even know they exist. If I don't know they exist, then I can't acquire them. They can't be mine, even just because they're in my domain, which is interesting in and of itself, right? Like if you come into my house and find something that apparently has been lying there for 100 years or something, my house isn't that old, but let's say, um, you can take it theoretically, it's, even though it's in my house. It's a crazy idea, but basically you'd be able to take it. Um, and then we said, if it's in a new wall, then it really depends which side of the wall. So to do this, you have to, right, you have to think, we're not talking about walls like in our houses nowadays, but you're talking about a very thick wall that has indentations in it and people leave things in the wall. So it all depends, it's my wall and my property that borders on the public domain. And if it's on the side that's closer to the public domain, then it's the public domain. Then basically we assume someone put it there, left it, and you can take it. If it's on the side, the inside half, well, then it's mine, okay, in that part of the, the thickness of it. So now, right, theoretically, it could be a hole that goes all the way in, but it's a matter of where it's sitting. So you might see it from outside my, my property, but if it's on my half on the inside, then, right, it's like there's this imaginary line in the middle. So then we have this last line, which we'll get back to later, which is, even if it's mine, let's say it's on the inner part of the wall, but if my house is a house that it's rented out to other people, then again, it's heft care, it's ownerless. We're going to have to understand that case because what do you mean? If I rent my house out and you're living in the house, so you're renting it, you should get it. Why are we saying, well, we don't know which renter it was and it seems weird. And, and in fact, it's going to contradict a Mishnah in Shkalim. We'll get there soon. So the Gemara started off with that question of the Amoraim and basically we said, we assume it's old because it looks old, right? If it doesn't look old and it's not rusty, then that would be a different story. Bekotel Chadash, now starting at the top of our daf, a new wall, it all depends which half you found it on. But now we're going to see that there's other clues that could give you an indica indication of who it belongs to, not just that. And in fact, ones that could go against that a little bit, which is, Ama Ravashi, Sakina Batar Kata, Bekisa Batar Shinse. When it comes to a knife, it goes by the handle. Right? If I would put a knife in my wall to keep it, I wouldn't put it in with the blade pointing out. Right? It's like ever happened to you where you, like I, I, I think this case came up somewhere where right, I put my hand into the drying rack and the knife went right into my hand, right? That, that people don't generally put things in that you would basically pierce yourself when you would pull it out. So a knife, you'd be able to tell by the direction it's going in. Who put it in, someone on the outside or someone on the inside? go by where the handle is. A money bag, it would go by the, the laces. Where you, a money bag is basically a little satchel with a tie at the top. Now again, you're going to put it in, you're not going to put it in with the, with the bag facing out. You're going to put it with the, with the laces facing out so you can easily pull it out. So it's all going to depend on where the lace is, on which side, the inside or the outside. So <coughs> after Ravashi says this, they say, well, what about our Mishnah? It says, Why don't we just look? Is the handle going in? Is the handle going out? Are the laces facing in? 
you know, on the outside or uh, going inside or the face or the lace is facing outside. And then it should be very obvious to which the Gemara says, The Mishnah <coughs> is talking about cases of items that are symmetrical, that don't have that kind of issue. Okay, and Rav Ash is adding that if it wasn't symmetrical and it would be particularly in a particular direction, then you would know. So what is this udra? Udra seems to be this wool, like pieces of wool that it's not like there's one side or the other side. Or Naska, Rashi even says, you can read it inside, plata shal kesef, okay, like a, like a, like a silver um, plate. You know, they say plata, I tried to do the word, but a silver brick, right? Which basically, it's the same in either direction. There's no way, no way to know. It doesn't even have to be symmetrical. It's just, it's a silver bar, thank you. Um, it doesn't have to be symmetrical. It just really needs to be that there's no issue of which direction you would put it in. <coughs> okay, next. Tana. Here's another Brita that talks about this, this issue. What if the hole went through from the outside all the way to the inside of the house? So we have this wall, this thick wall, and then we have a hole that goes through from one side to the other. So if it filled up the whole space and it wasn't on this half or that half, but it filled in the whole space, then well, what do you think we do? Cholkin, right? Our classic split of 50-50, to which the Gemara says, okay, pshita, that's very obvious. Why do I need a bright to tell me this? So they say, well, lo tzricha de mishpa b'chad gisa. We need it because it could be the hole isn't going horizontally, but the hole is going on an angle. And it's going, you know, up to down, either from inside to outside or outside to inside, it doesn't really matter which one. And it now fills up the whole thing. Now you might've thought, so the, the, the ruling is we split it 50-50. But you might've thought, wait, maybe it really was all on the half that was near the top part of it. And then it slid down and filled up the whole space because of gravity. To which the answer, Kamashman, we don't have to be concerned for that. We split a 50-50 no matter what. Even though there's a chance that maybe it really was, let's say, all inside my house, and then it just slid down and, and now covers the whole space, we don't have to worry about that. We still, still split a 50-50, and that's the halacha that they're trying to teach you in this bright. Okay, now we're going to go to a bit of a longer sugya about the rental. So if it was a place that you rented to other people, even if I find it in the house, right again, I'm assuming that I didn't, I didn't go into your house to find it, but I, it was in the hole and it was on the side that was closer to the inside. I saw it from outside your house. I could still take it. So now, Amai, why don't we just say it goes by whoever was renting your house last? And in fact, Milotznan doesn't that what we see, isn't that what we see in a Mishnah? Now, it's a totally different case, but there's a Mishnah in Shkalim that talks about money that you find in Jerusalem and in different places in Jerusalem and at different times of year, do we have to assume that the money might be Maser Shani money, okay, which has sanctity to it. So now why would we assume the money's Maser Shani? Because people generally brought, if you remember, they would redeem their, their fruits that they're supposed to bring to Jerusalem, the Maser Shani. They redeem it on a coin. They bring the coins to Jerusalem and they have to, we just talked about this not long ago, you have to spend the money in Jerusalem and on all sorts of things. A lot of people, and we'll see this in a minute, would buy meat with it. And you would use, you, know, you buy an animal and sacrifice the animal in the Beit HaMikdash. That was like a, a very main use of the Maser Shani money. So they say, I'm on. Lezo batra batra. Milotzan doesn't say in the Mishnah in Maser Shani. Ma'ot shenin tzu lefnei so charei behemot. If you find money near the people who are selling the animals, we assume, now near means, okay, we're going to see this in the next Mishnah, near means, but more on the side of the purchaser, okay? He says in front of the Soharei Behemot, meaning on the side of the counter near where the people buy it. We assume, la Maasir, most of the animals bought in Jerusalem were bought with Maasir Shani money. So we assume that the people who go to buy from the animals when they drop their money, what money are they dropping and losing? Maser Shani money. So you find money there, you assume it's Maser Shani. Bahara Bayit, you can see why this case is similar because we're talking about lost items. It's not about returning lost items, it's talking about the status of the money. Is it Maser Shani? Is it, is it Kodesh? Is it Chulin? Right? Does it have the sanctity to it or is it not? So now, if you find it Bahara Bayit, now Bahara Bayit, there's different explanations why this is, but we'll go with once people got to Bayit, they had already purchased their stuff. 
So the money they have left was probably chulim money, okay? Not sanctified, not master shani money. So any money we find on Harabai, we assume is chulim. Be Yerushalayim, and now in Jerusalem, we're going to distinguish. If you find, let's say, in the marketplaces in Jerusalem, money on the ground. Bishar Yomot chulim. During the year, we assume it's regular money because not, right? A lot of people bought lots of things in Jerusalem. The majority of the stuff bought wasn't, right? The majority of the, the animals bought was Master Shani money purchases. But the majority of everything else was not Master Shani money. But Bishat HaRegel, on the Regel, you had a huge number of people coming who only came during the holidays and they would bring all their Master Shani money and spend it on all sorts of things. So if you're in the marketplace in Jerusalem during the holiday, then we assume Hakol Maaseh. Any money you find there is Maaseh. And Amar of Shmaya Bar Zeiri, my time, he says, why is this? And he explains, They would sweep them every day. Okay, this has to do with Shvatzim and things like that. And Tuma, we're not going to get into that. But since they would sweep the Shuk every day, imagine, right? Like you think about the Shuk as being a dirty place, but apparently they swept it every day. The big question is, why on the regal do we assume, even though a lot of people bring Maser Shani money, but who's to say it's not from last week and the week before that and all year long? Most of the money comes from during the year. To which they say, ah, Rav, Shmua, uh, Rav Shmaya Barzairi explains, listen, most of the money comes from, the, from today because they sweep. So we assume because they sweep and clean every day, that means that kama kama, right? This is what hanami kama kama azlu, and hane achri. I'm sorry, uh, right? Kama kama azlu v'hane achrininu. The ones that were there earlier, the first ones, are already gone. Okay, either they were right, they were found by people, or they were swept up, they were cleaned up, and whatever you see now is from now. So now, what does this have to do with our case? Well, it's exactly the same thing. If I had different people renting my house, so they find something in the wall, we assume it belongs to the last tenant, even if right now the house is uninhabited. We're going to give it to the previous tenant, right? We can assume that the same thing. When you leave a house, you clean it out. Now, we all know that sometimes people leave things in the walls, right? And But the assumption is you clean things out, you empty the house, so the next person there, they're the one. So now we're going to have an, an answer to try to explain this Mishnah. Amarish Lakish Mishum Bar Kapara. He's going to quote Bar Kapara answering this question. Kigon Pundak Yisrael. You didn't really understand the case. It's not that I rented my house out to one person and then to another after that. And then and they had, there was a new tenant. But there were three Jews living there at the same time. In other words, I rented out the space to three people. And now we explain, right, that that's the issue. Since there's three people in the room, and we're going to see this a little more in detail soon, we assume that when one lost an item, they had yeush, and, and basically they think they'll never get it back. And that's why if I find it, I can take it, okay? Because it's not clear which of the three people. And then we assume, because it's not so clear, we're going to talk about this a little bit. I don't want to say it yet, but there's yeush, okay? So now we're going to say, why is there yeush? Okay, the first assumption... If you're living with three people and you're sharing a room and you lose your item, they're going to basically say, well, since you were three in the room, it sounds like, if you remember, Rabbi Shimon ben Elazar and Daf Kafdali, what did he say? If it's a makom, remember there was the Zuto Shel Yam and the Shluli Shel Nahar, and a place where Rabbi Mitzuyim, there's a lot of people there. So you assume if I drop it, someone else will take it. So now we had a whole big question about Rabbi Shimon ben Elazar, though. Does he say it when it's a majority Jews or only Gentiles? Do we assume that Jews have a good soul, and they're going to return it, right? Or do we assume, no, they're no different than anyone else in this sense, and they might steal it, and therefore there's yeush on the part of anyone if there's a majority of Jews. So, wait, if this is what Bar Kapara says, that there were three Jews living there at the time, and that's why you can take it, because there was obviously yeush, that seems like he holds like Rabbi Shem Belazar, forget about Rav Yisrael, this is just three people, right? Three Jews, one lost an item, you can assume one of the two took it, and therefore, and they're going to steal it, and therefore, there's Yeyush. So, it seems like it's an unpleasant roommate situation if you don't trust your, your roommates. So now they say, <clears throat> and then this would be a problem, because we had a whole question. Does he say it in Rovi Yisrael? Does he not? If it was so clear from this Mishnah, 
then we'd have an easy answer. That, oh yeah, sure. Clear from here, the Rabbi Shimon ben Elazar, right, holds even Rov Yisrael. So they don't like that. So we're going to have two possible answers. One is to reject Bar Kapara, and this is an alternative answer. I'll go with him, but I'll change it a little bit. And I'll say, oh no, we're talking about that you find an item in the wall where it's closer to the side of the inside, and it was a place where there were three Gentiles living there, and therefore we can assume if one of them lost an item, they already had Yehush, they said, I'm never going to get it back, obviously one of them stole it, and that resolves the issue because then it's all an issue of Gentiles. And again, right, it's not that Gentile Jews are better than Gentiles, it's that the Gentiles that were living in those times were known more to be thieves, okay? Although some people even think maybe the Jews, so it's unclear. But if we don't want to have clarity about that, because the Sugi didn't have clarity about it on Daf Kaftalid, then we'll assume we're talking about three Gentiles. Rav Nachman, Amar Abba is going to explain Bar Kapara and disconnect it, though, from Rabbi Shema ben Elazar and say the reason why there's Yehush is not because there's a lot of people and, you know, the lot of people are these three people and one basically assumes one of the other two is going to be stealing and this is indicative of any case of a lot of Jews around and you can assume someone's stealing. No, it's different. It's a unique situation. It has nothing to do with finding something on the street in a shuk where the majority of people are Jews. That's different. There, we don't know what Rabbi Shimon Lazar would say. But here, we're going to have a different reason. And then we're going to say that Rabbi Nachman is actually consistent in this explanation with something else that he himself says. So Rav Nachman Amar Rabbi Ravua, he explains the following. Afilu tema l'shloshai Yisrael, even you don't have to reject his explanation and say, oh no, it must be three Gentiles. No, it's three Jews. My time, huh? what's the reason? Ha'hu did nafel me name Yash. We definitely assume that there was Yash here. Why? Well, we have to explain. Meimar Amar, the one who lost it says, imagine you have two roommates, you lose an item. Well, we say the following, okay? So now, Michti inishachrini lohave bahade elahane. Now, when I find this item, that you lost in a room with your two roommates, I can say really that Mihti in I can I basically again I have to do the detective work and figure out was there Yesh, was there not Yesh. So I look at the scenario. There were three people living together. When you're living together with two other people and you lose something, what do you do? You look for it, you can't find it, you ask your roommates. So we can say Mihti in Shafrini Lohave Bahade Alahani. Now the only three people in the room were the three of you. There wasn't anybody else living with you, which means that Amre Kamayu Kamazimne Lahadruli. You must have gone to the other people and said, "Listen, if you by accident took my shirt or you on purpose took my shirt, please return it." Okay, and you must have said it more than once because you were, you know, you must have been looking for your item, and then the Lahadruli. Now, obviously, you didn't return it. Why didn't you return it? Because you actually didn't take it, right? But or the the roommate didn't return it to you because they didn't take it. Okay, but you keep asking, you know, can you give it back to me? Can you give it back to me? And no response. The hashta the hadru, in other words, uh, you're going to say to yourself, I already asked them a few times to return it and they didn't return it. Do you think they're going to return it now? If I already asked a few times and they haven't returned it, what's going to change tomorrow? They're probably never going to return it. Which means, right, idate la if they really wanted to return it, hadru aniele, they would have returned it already. The high de loa you say, can't find this shirt. Now, it happens it's in the wall, but you don't know that. So you can't find your shirt. You ask your roommates. After you ask a few times, they don't return it. You say, right? But that title, the migzala. My roommate must have just stolen it from me. And then, right, besides going to look for a new roommate, right, you basically have Yehush and say, I'm never going to get this shirt back. So if that's the case and I find the shirt and there's three of you in the room, I can assume that you had Yehush because I can assume that this is the scenario that happened. That you tried to get it back, no one returned it to you, obviously, because they didn't have it, but you didn't know that that was why. You assumed it's just three of us in the room, you didn't think about the wall, right? And you blame, this is classic, by the way, whenever I can't find something, I blame someone else in my house for having, you know, where'd you put this? Where'd you put this? It turns out sometimes I stuck it somewhere to, you know, my fault. But but anyway, that's a, that's a scenario we can imagine happening, which is why if there's three, even though they're Jewish roommates, you still assume that the owner's going to have Yehush, which means I can take it. But as Rav Nachman Latame, and this fits in with something else Rav Nachman said, to Amar Rav Nachman, Ra'a Sela, turning now to Amabet, if you see a Sela, okay, you see, oh, see my mic wasn't plugged in. Okay. 
If you see a seller, shenafal lishnai mishnai, chayav lachzir. You see money on the floor that fell from two people. Okay, now again, you have to try to imagine the scenario. They don't really tell you all the details, but I'm going to fill in with you know what I think is going on here. So I see two of you in an area, and I see a coin fall, but I don't see who it fell from. Okay. I have to return that coin. Why? I have to assume there's no yeush there. Because now normally we said you lose money on the street. We assume you know right away and we assume you do yeush right away because you think you'll never get it back. But in this scenario, you're both in uh, maybe a confined space. It's just the two of you there. And when you see you lose that you lose that money, when you realize, oh, my money's lost and you knew that five minutes ago you would check your wallet, it was there. Now you check your wallet, it's not there. The only other person with you is this one other person. Okay, this isn't going to be the fully comparable case because this is two people, not three people. We're going to compare a case of two people and a case of three people. And then we're going to show that Rav Nachman, in this case with the three people, matches what he says about the three people there. But first we have to understand the foil case, which is the two people. So I have to return that. When I see the coin fall, I have to go and return my time. Because I would did not fall, meaning loma yaish. Because the one who it fell from didn't have yayosh yet, for sure. Memar armor, why not? You will say, Say to yourself, listen, it was just me and the other person, and now my money is missing. Which means that if, right, assuming you don't think it's lost, because you can't find it, you looked, you didn't see it. So you say, I'll just grab the other person. And I'll say, you are the one who took it, so give it back to me. And since I know for sure that you took it, I'll get it back. Now what happens, it's not true, because it was lost. But you can't find it. So you just assume the person stole it, which is also an interesting <coughs> conclusion to jump to. We all do this, right? Oh, can't find it. It must be somebody stole it. So you assume the person took it. And you assume I can get it back from this person because it's, they're the only suspect in the case. But Bishlosha, you can see where this is going. With three people already... You don't have to return it. If I see three of you and I see a coin drop and I know who it drops from, I can assume that as soon as you realize it's lost, you have yeyush. And I can go pick it up. Because my time, huh? what's the reason? You definitely, had, whoever, whichever one of the three of you have felt from, definitely despaired. So listen, if there were, right, since there's two people with me, and it could be that one, it could be that one. In a lahai, I'm a If I, you know, grab one of you and say, give me my money back, you'll say it wasn't me. In a lahai, I'm a And the other one will say, it's not me. And I won't have a clear claim against you. This is like we talked about a bari and a shema, a definitive claim and a, and a sefe claim. I don't have a clear claim on you. I don't know. It could be you, 50-50 chance. So I feel like I'll never get my money back because I can't pinpoint that it's definitely you. Okay, so now... If it's two people, then I can't. So this matches what Rav Nachman said about the roommate situation. If it's three of you living in a room together, then the assumption is that one will, if one loses something and thinks that the other one stole it, they'll give up on it because they'll say, oh, well, I'll never get it back. So I won't be able to prove it. So that was all trying to explain to, to basically divorce the case of Shlosha Yisraelim and the explanation of Bar Kapara from the case of Rabbi Shimon ben Elazar, where he talked about Rovi Yisraelim on Daf Kapdalit, where it's not the same thing at all. Because the one there was Rovi Yisraelim on the street, and that's a whole different majority. That's when anyone could have picked it up. But here, it's an issue of, it's, it's a finite number of people, and therefore specifically because it's finite, but it's more than two, then there's a concern that, you know, uh, there's, a, there's an assumption that the owner says, I'll never be able to retrieve this item and had yeosh and therefore you can take it. Okay, and that explains the wall, even if it's on the inside, if there were three people renting the space, then there's definitely yeosh. I'm a Rava. Now Rava is going to have a slew of statements. Hi, so the first statement is connected with this, which is really, and then the others are going to be really about lost items in general. But the first one is going to be to narrow the focus of what Rav Nachman said. Okay? About this case with the coin. If I find a coin on the street that fell from two people or three people, right now we're going to talk about the three people case, we can assume there was Yehosh. She's going to say, well, there's another factor here. 
the fact that we said Bishlosha with three people, you don't have to return the coin because obviously they're going to assume I won't be able to get it from either one of them. That's only in a case where it's less than three prutot. Okay, if the value of the coin that fell is less than, if we, that means if we would split it up into three, if each one would own, would get less than a pruto, which is really not significant at all. Ava, and that's why we can assume the coin fell from only one of them. But, if the money, if the three of you are around, one of you drops a coin, and then you can't, right, and then the assumption is at this point it's lost. Well, and you think maybe one of them took it. If there was Sheva Pruta Lekol Chavichan, Chayav Lachzil. If that amount amounted to the fact that if we split it into three, it would be worth a Pruta for each of you. You would each get a Pruta, meaning it was three Pruta or more. Then I would have to return it. So why is this? What does this have anything to do with anything? My time, Imur Shutafeinu Velom Yashu. It could be. Now again, this is me finding this, seeing this scenario, and not knowing really what the facts are. It could be that you all three jointly own this coin. And then what happened? Well, you dropped it and then no one returns it to you, right? Because, you know, you go to them and say, hey, did you steal my coin? Now, why would someone steal your coin if you were partners in it? No, that's not really stealing. That's just taking it. The assumption is that maybe one of them, you think, anyway, you don't know. It happens to be on the floor, but you don't know that. You think one of them took it just to play around with you because it's really all jointly owned by you. It's like kids who own toys together and one like grabs the toy from the other and you're just trying to be annoying or something. But but the idea is that you don't really think the other one's stealing it because it's jointly owned by all of you. So, okay, partners often do steal things from each other. But the assumption here is that if you really were partners in the money, and then again, it has to be worth something for you to be partners in it. You wouldn't be partners in one pruta for three people. It's not worth it. Like it's worth nothing. So the assumption is if it has enough worth that it could be a shared item from the three of you, then we don't let you as a as an outsider come and take it and assume that it was Yeosh because you didn't really give up on getting it back because you're partners with them and you assume they'll give it back to you. But that's only if it's worth three pruta. Ika de Amre, some people say Amareva. Even two pruta would work. Chayav then you would have to return it. My taima, because you could still assume they were shutafim. Why? If it's really not worth enough. Well, you, it's possible if it's two pruta, it could be one of them just gave up their rights to the other two, and then to two people it's worth a pruta, and it could be they really are shutafim. So it's either two or it's three, but the point is if there's a concern that perhaps they're all joint owners of it, then there wouldn't be yeyush, and then you wouldn't be able to take it. So that depends on how much it's worth. And that was just a comment on that piece of Rav Nachman we brought <coughs> to prove Rav Nachman's explanation of Bar Kapara of the three Israeli, but it was about that side case about finding the money, which wasn't, by the way, in a house that was rented by three people. That was just a different scenario where there's only three people. <coughs> The <coughs> Amarava, and now we're going to have a f- two statements of Ra- or a few sta- a few cases of Rava, where Rava is going to explain certain cases. There's three cases here, where you take an item and you do something wrong, and what you did wrong according to Torah law, like how many things you transgressed in this one action or multiple action. We'll see. The Amarava, Ba'asela Shanafla. I guess he's talking about this because it's another case where money falls on the ground. Nitala lifne yeush. So let's assume, okay, again, what exactly the details of this case are you have to kind of fill in. But the assumption is I'm standing on the street, I see you drop money. I saw it. I saw it fall. You didn't see it yet. Then I take it immediately. Okay, before you even notice it's gone. And I take it not to return to you, but almanatli goes la. Theoretically, I have to return it at that point because you haven't realized. That, right, it's, it's different if I find money on the street. I don't know who the owner is. But that's why I assume in this case, I must have seen it fall from you. And I go and pick it up knowing it's yours. That's basically theft. Okay, but it's a different kind of theft than mugging you on the street or going into your house and stealing something. Because it's a theft that's intertwined with a lost item. So because of that, number one, okay, over bekulan, okay, I'm basically over on a lot of things. I did a few things wrong here. Number one, Mishum Lotigzol, I stole because it was really yours. You hadn't had Yeosh on it. You were still the owner. 
ומשום השב תשיבן. And I'm liable, I have to return it to you. And I didn't return it to you. There's a commandment. Return the lost item. And משום לא תוכל להתעלם. And furthermore, because it says, don't ignore a lost item, right? Your friend lost something. You can't just stand there and ignore it. So you did ignore it. I mean, you didn't ignore it, but you ignored your responsibility to return it. So three things. And all the more so, let's say you decide to return it. Even if you returned it, but if it was after Yeush, Matanahu de Yaivle, the Sura de Avid Avid. At this point, <coughs> you're basically giving someone a gift. And you basically can't fix it. Because at this point, you had Yeush, so it's ownerless now. It wasn't ownerless before when you picked it up, but it's ownerless now. So you actually can't return it to its owner because the owner had Yeush. So you're stuck, okay? You started off on the wrong foot and you got yourself really deep down into problems. Number one, you stole. Number two, you, you didn't return it. Number three, you ignored it. And now when you return it after they did have Yeush, basically you have a problem because you can't actually return the lost item to the owner because the owner's not an owner anymore. So you really got yourself into problems. Now, there's a big problem with this whole thing and I, I quickly saw the chat. I assume that's what you're writing, which is, I didn't read the whole thing, but there's a big problem. This is Rava. What does Rava say? Yeyush shalomi dat is yeyush. Meaning if you're yeyush later, retroactively it was yeyush. So there's a big problem with this. Some of the commentaries say that this is actually Rava and not Rava. Okay, I think if you look, right, there's a gimel here. Let's see if it's if there they say it. Um, that gimel goes to here. The Rabban katav de tzarich lomar Rava with a hey. Okay, and... Anyway, there's a debate about how some try to rectify them, reconcile it with Rava, but some people just change it. Very often, Rava and Rava get interchanged because on the manuscripts they would do Reish Bet Chupchik, and you know the person print, you know, who was writing the next manuscript didn't necessarily know, might have filled it in in the wrong way, and then it got into the printing. So anyway, or it could be when they printed it, they also you know worked did some work, but they might not have realized. And it could be it's just Raba, and then it would fit in with Abaye, and that would work a little bit better. Okay, but that's a side point I'm not going to deal with right now. Let's just understand the case. So the case is, you picked it up when you really shouldn't have, you stole it, and then you have issues with stealing, you have issues with lost items, and you have a problem when you return it, you don't actually fix the problem. You fix the problem of that you've returned a stolen item, but you don't really fix the problem of returning a lost Item because the owner already said, I'm not going to keep it anymore. Nitala lifne yush. Case number two. You take it before there's yeush. Almanat lachzira. You took it with the good intentions. You wanted to return it. But then, laachar yeush. But then, the owner, you see the person look in their wallet and see, oh, I lost my money and give up basically on getting it back. And then, nitkaven the gozla. Then you said, oh, maybe I'll keep it for myself. The problem is that when you picked it up, you already had a responsibility to return it. That's not the same as picking it up after Yeush. So now you want to steal it. Now you're not really stealing it anymore because your intent to steal happened after the owner already made it ownerless. On the other hand, you didn't fulfill the mitzvah of returning a lost item. You also didn't go transgress. You can't ignore it because you didn't ignore it. You actually picked it up to return so it's only Hashev to Shivan in this case. Himtimla, if you waited, This is a funny case. You see the person drop the money. And you say, I'm not going to take it right now because, because I don't want to have to return it. I'll wait till they notice the money's missing. I'll watch them have Yehush. I'll go pick it up. So now you didn't actually steal it, but you did something a little bit not appropriate. And we'll see what exactly your problem is. What you can maybe guess already what you did wrong. So, in this case, all you did was ignore, right? You should have, before they realized it was lost, return a lost item to your friend and don't ignore, right? But since you never picked it up, you weren't liable to Hashev Tishivim, right? Hashev Tishivim comes in once you pick it up. You didn't pick it up, so you're not obligated to return. But you are obligated to not ignore and pretend you didn't see it. And that's what you did, basically. So, no stealing, no problem of that you didn't fulfill returning it because you never picked it up until it wasn't until it was ownerless. 
but you ignored lo tuchal italim. So Rev is kind of getting into the almost the, the conceptual ideas that are all going on here, the isulim, the transgressions in the Torah that you can do, and tries to isolate, you know, cases where you would have one or the other or a mix or a combination of things. Amarav. You see your friend lose money in the sand. Okay, I'll tell you some good stories about this. One time I was on the beach and uh, we borrowed my father-in-law's car and we lost the keys in the sand. It was pretty bad. We were nowhere near the house either, so it was pretty... Uh, in the end, we went back, we searched, we found them. Okay, and another time I remember my friend, I can't actually remember what the end of the story, I think she actually lost them. She was running on the beach, lost her keys. I remember there were a bunch of us nearby and people went to try to help her find them and, it, and, and in the end, I think they didn't find the keys at all. So you know how when you lose things in the sand, it's kind of gone. Now keys are very different because keys are obviously worth a lot, a lot, uh, there's a huge value to that. As opposed to coins, which you lose in the sand, which you basically give up on right away. And that's why if you see if you see money that your friend lost in the sand and you pick it up, you don't have to return it. My time, huh? Because for sure, whoever dropped it in the sand thinks, I'm never getting this back. Now, here it's really interesting. Even if you see the guy come and start digging and searching for the money, you still get to keep it. We still assume there was Yehush, so... How could that be? The person by digging is showing they didn't give up on getting it back. Well, Memor Amar, you could say, Ki not, you know, the person, Memor Amar is what's going through the head of the person who's digging. Well, Memor Amar, he could be saying, Ki didi, You lose your money in the sand. So what do you say? Listen, I'm never going to find that money. But you know what? If I lost money in the sand, probably other people lost money in the sand. So I'll just dig and maybe I'll find money in the sand. Maybe I'll find someone else's money. But they definitely don't think they're going to find their own money. There's such a small chance of that, which means they had yeush, which means if you find it, you get to keep it. So this was just another bunch of cases of how yeush works and what we can make assumptions about people in order to figure out whether or not there was yeush. New Mishnah. And this is a little bit similar to the wall. Sign, right? Again, signs that indicate or hints to allude to whose money was it. So now we're going to get to a place where you're in a store. And in a store, it's a little bit tricky because there's the owner of the store who owns it, but there's lots of people who walk in and out of the store. So Matzavah Chanu, you find an item in a store. Hare Elu Shelo. Okay, we're talking about a lost item. We're not talking about an item that they sell in the store, okay, or money that you find on the floor in a store. You can take because the assumption is it's one of any of the million people who walk through that store. Bein HaTeva Lachem Bani. But if it's behind the counter... Right, where the cash register is, or, you know, then you're going to assume that belongs to any money there or items that fall there must belong to the person whose store it is. Lefnei shulchani. Now we're going into a money changer. So here there's, we're talking about money. Money that you find in a money changer's booth. So, or, or how, you know, a store. Hare elu shelo. So again, anywhere you find it there, it's yours. You can keep it. Bain hakisela shulchani, but between the chair and the shulchani, where the chair, where the shulchani is sitting, okay, we assume that means right, like on the floor there. Hare elu shel shulchani. It belongs to the money changer because stuff on that side, right? Nobody goes to that side. Halokat perot mechaviro. This is a different case. You you buy fruits from a friend. Osha shilach lo chaviro perot, or your friend sent you a, a basket of fruit. Umatzam behem maot, and you found money in there. Hare elu shelo. You get to keep them. Okay, that's because we assume that it wasn't them who put it there. It just somehow ended up there. We'll get to this case later. Um, but if there was a, a sign, like some sort of indicator, because they were bound up together, that's already money with a siman. That's like we saw in the Mishnah. No tail of machris. You'd have to you know, announce whose they are. Again, you don't assume they were the person who sent it to you. You assume they got in there somehow accidentally, because people don't generally send fruits with money, right? It sounds a little bit like, Joseph, when he sent the brothers back with the with the food in their bags, you know that's not normally done. So now we're going to have a halacha of Rabbi Elazar. We're going to raise the difficulty on what he says from the Mishnah, then resolve the difficulty and say, well, it's inconclusive from the Mishnah, and then say what motivated Rabbi Elazar to say this, and with that we'll finish our daf. So Rabbi Elazar comes and says he's an emora, right? And he comes and says, "Afilu munachim al gabei shulchan." This halacha in our Mishnah. 
that if you find it in the Shulchanis space, you get to keep it unless it's right between the chair and the Shulchani himself. So even if you find it on the table where they do the money changing, you can assume that's money that belongs to who knows who and there was Yehosh and you can take it. So the which the Gemara says, but it says in the Mishnah, Lefnei Shulchani Hare Elu Shalo, which sounds like before the Shulchani, like before his table, it sounds like, which would imply, right, if before the Shulchani Hare Elu Shalo, but on the table, it would sound like, Aval Ahal Gabe Shulchan De Shulchani, right? Anything on the table, it sounds like, because the Mishnah didn't relate to that. The Mishnah just related to before the Shulchani. That means like past the table. But on the table, it would sound like it belongs to the Shulchani. So that sounds like a difficulty. To which the Gemara answers, well, you can make the same inference the opposite way from the end of the Mishnah. Because it, or the, <coughs> the second line about the Shulchani. If it's between the chair and the Shulchani, belongs to the Shulchani, that sounds like on the floor. But on the table in front of the Shulchani, that wasn't addressed by the Seifa. Which means that, right, this is a classic case where one part of the Mishnah gives one extreme, right, before the Shulchani, but not the table. The other case gives under, you know, where the Shulchani is sitting, but not on the table. So it brings the other extreme, and the middle case isn't really mentioned. So therefore, they say basically, Elamehalek Elamashro. Now, you really can't tell what, right? Sometimes we bring this as a Hagu Fakashia. The Mishnah itself contradicts because it brings this extreme, it brings that extreme. Each one would assume the opposite about the middle case. In this case, they basically just say, it's inconclusive. So you can't question Rabbi Elazar from that because it's totally inconclusive. To which the Gemara then says, the Rabbi Elazar Hamanale. Well, where did Rabbi Elazar get this from? That on the Shulchan, you can actually take it and assume it's hefker, ownerless. So I'm a Rava. We're going to have two possibilities about what in the Mishnah. I'm a Nita Kashita. Okay. The wording in the Mishnah was strange to him. It could have used different terminology, which would have been, and, and because it shows this, that means it's including that the table would be his own. So, you know, you can keep it. Why is that? My area, so the first answer is, my area detani bena kisei la shulchani shal shulchani. Litnei ala shulchan. If it wanted to tell you that on the table and on the floor next to the shulchani belongs to the shulchani, well, it should have given the case that was less likely. It should have said on the table. The fact that it chose the case that was closer to the shulchani and not on the table would seem to indicate that it's only if it's on the floor near the shulchani and not on the table that it belongs to the shulchani. That's the first one. That's pretty easy proof. Second one's a little more confusing, but it's not too bad. Inami matzah b'shulchanut. Okay, what is b'shulchanut? That means in the money changer's store. Because it should have said that. What did it say? In the beginning of the mission, it says, matzah b'chanut, you find in a store. So they say, kidda katani resha, matzah b'chanut shelo. So because the first one says, if you find in the store, it's yours, right? You can keep it. It should have said, and if you find it in the money changer store, bashul chanut, hare elu shalo. But it didn't say that. So the fact that they use the strange lashon of lifnei shulchani, lifnei shulchani must come to include something else besides just finding it randomly in the store. It must be even on the table. Okay? Then you get to keep it. So we had two explanations as to where Rabbi Lazar gets what he said from the Mishnah, even though we did say the Mishnah was a little inconclusive, but because of the specific wording chosen, that would prove Rabbi Lazar. Or at least that's his source. So now, just quick review. With that, we'll finish. <clears throat> we started with this thing of the wall. We had all sorts of indicators, right? Hints that would allude to which side was it left on, depending on you know which way it was going. All different kind of things. Whether it was you know if it's if it's in the middle of both, if it's if it fills the whole space, we split it fifty fifty. We said, what's that come to teach? Then we had the case of renting it out. For a place was rented out to a bunch of people. We brought the contradiction for the mission in Shkalim. We had two different resolutions. One we had a problem with because of Rabbi Shem ben Lazar, but we tried to resolve that as well. And with that, we got into Rabbi Nachman's whole distinction between two people and three people when you find something, and what's the assumptions we can make about the people and what they're thinking. And from there, Rav, Rava kind of narrowed a little bit the focus of Rabbi Nachman, the case of the three. It's only if it has less than Sheva Pruta for each one of them. Otherwise, they could be partners, and that could explain things. And then Rava went into a whole bunch of different cases, where maybe it was Rava who went into a whole bunch of different cases where someone was to take an item and in what way would he be transgressing or she be transgressing which issues that, you know, overlap between theft 
and yeish, right? There's a bit of an overlap between them. I'm sorry, theft and returning lost items, and we had all the different permutations. With that, we then got to the last case in the Mishnah of the, the last case we've been discussing, which is finding it in the store, which loca- which place in the store would be the store owners, which case in the store would be the, the persons. And we saw kind of basic dividing line in the Mishnah, but then we saw Rabbi Lazar who had, you know, made clear another division line, which was, you know, on the table even, we can still assume that that's half care. And then where does he get that from the Mishnah? That will finish for today. Wishing everyone a good day and a Shushan Purim Sameach.